Well, good morning. Good to see you here. You got visitors. We're thankful that you're here. If you got your Bible, open up to First John chapter two. First John chapter two. That is where we're going to begin our study together this morning. Among our visitors this morning, we've got a whole group from Judson Road in Longview, where I just moved from, and uh, I knew some of them were going to be here, and then one of them was a surprise, and uh, it's good to, good to have you guys here. I, I certainly miss you guys. Um, thankful that, uh, that I get to see you again. You all have a very, very special place in my heart. And man, I'm glad to be home. Gospel meetings, as Brother Evans can probably attest, can certainly be refreshing at times, but man, they can certainly just wear you out, and there's nothing like coming home and uh, getting in your own bed. Uh, I'd say getting in your own house. That's not ready yet, but we're working on that. But, um, it, is, it is good to be back with you all. First John chapter 2. We want to study this morning about the world. You know, things, some things in life don't really hit you until you have kids, right? And you hear that before you have kids, you're like, yeah, 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 whatever. And then you have kids, and you're like, reality slaps you in the face, and okay, yeah, they were right. There, there is something different when you have kids. That, that moment where you, you've got your newborn, and they're in that little incubator-looking-like box thing in the hospital, and they let you push your baby out of the, the observation ward and back into your room, and reality hits you that, hey, no one else is taking care of this baby but me, and, and, and now it's really, yeah, things get real. And we're to that juncture in, in my family's life where, as many of you know, my daughter is starting school this year. And school's different than when I was in school, right? And, I mean, that, that's just, you know, back in, the, back in the early 90s. Things have changed. And it becomes a little, little worrisome. And things that you didn't quite think about in times past, suddenly you begin to think about, and I'm about to send her off to school. Do, do I trust these people to teach her? Do I trust that she's going to be in a good environment, not only for her mental and emotional development, but at least to some degree her spiritual development? I certainly don't expect the school to be her spiritual guardian, but I'd like it if she wasn't going to face spiritual hardship simply because she goes there. And it's not necessarily that the school is in any way wrong, but it's that the world is out there. And the world is active. And the world is always teaching. And we want to talk this morning about three things that the world will teach our children. Three things that we need to make sure that we're teaching in our own homes and in our own families because we can bet that the world is. And if our children don't hear it from us, they are going to hear it from the world. And the things that they're going to hear from the world are not the things that God would have them to hear. And so that's, that's the track our study is going to take this morning. But we're going to begin there in 1 John chapter 2 as we talk some of what we mean when we talk about the world. And quite simply, we might define the world, at least for the purposes of our study this morning, as, as that section of humanity that at any given time is going to find itself separated from God. Look at 1 John chapter 2, and down here to verse 15. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. Where John would write and say, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world... The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away, and also it's lust, but the one who does the will of God abides forever. We begin to get an idea of what we mean by the world there, but come over to chapter 4. Chapter 4 and verse 4, You are from God, little children, and you have overcome them. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. 
They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them, but we are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. You, you have two spheres of influence. You have a sphere of influence that is related to God, and you have a sphere of influence that is related to Satan. Satan's sphere of influence, John would tell us, is the world. The world in which we live, but Paul would tell us in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we must conduct ourselves in this world, but we are not to belong to this world. We are to come out from this world, 2 Corinthians, and be separate. But nonetheless, we live in this world, and thus the world's influence is always around us, always teaching us, always trying to mold us and shape us into what it wants. The world is always in competition with God, with those who would live godly lives, and with simply the gospel itself. Listen to what John would say in his gospel message. In John 14 and verse 17, he would talk about the world not receiving God's message. But in John 17 and verse 25, he lays his cards on the table and would tell us very plainly that the world does not know God. John 17 and verse 25, as Jesus prays, O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you. And these have known that you did send me. The world doesn't know God. We shouldn't necessarily be surprised, and I think we've studied this a month or two ago, we shouldn't be surprised when the world acts like the world, Right? They're acting according to the influence that is about them. But we can make sure that we don't live like the world. We can make sure that we're not influenced to any great degree by the world. By understanding what the world is teaching and by counteracting that teaching in our own homes, in our own lives, and in the churches to which we belong. So let's look at, at three of these things that the world is teaching, and let's start here by recognizing that the world is going to teach morality. The world is teaching morality to our children. Whether we like it or not, everything that we see around us is a message. And as we have moved on in life, those messages become more and more. Did you ever think you were going to have a computer in your pocket or a TV in your pocket? I can remember, and, and, and for those that are younger in the audience, this is going to make no sense whatsoever. I remember one Christmas I asked for one of those handheld TVs. Do you remember those? Handheld TVs that had the really long antenna on it, and you tuned it like a radio. And I got one, and I thought I was so cool, and you could drive for about 10 minutes in a car and get reception with that thing, and then you had to fiddle with it like an AM knob on a radio. Oh, I thought that was just the neatest thing in the world. And now I can watch basically any movie I want to on my phone in my pocket and not have to tune a thing, right? But more than that, my daughter, who I have never taught this to, can pull out my phone and do the exact same thing. <laughs> right? And your kids and grandkids probably can do it too. And, and on one hand, it's cute and awe, and isn't that so great? But then on the other hand, it's like, whoa, they're about to experience some things uh, that I need to keep a close eye on. And I need to be watchful about that gospel meeting I was in this past week, I talked to a family who experienced just that, that their kids, you know, the grandma gave them uh, Kindle tablets for Christmas a few years back. And, you know, they, they set it up on the, uh, on the app store to make sure that they weren't going to be downloading anything that was, you know, rated uh, beyond their years. But then some of those games had chat features on them. And it's not just kids who get on there and use the chat feature. It's also, it's also some, some people who have some pretty uh, ungodly motivations, shall we say. And families deal with the fallout of that. I say all that to say this. Our kids are living in a world where they are constantly bombarded by messages of morality, whether it's on our phones, whether it's on TV, whether it's the media that we consume in any other way. 
the world is trying to influence our children and tell them what is right and what is wrong, what is moral and what is not, which is rather inconsistent when you think of it because the world, as, as so much of it espouses the tenets of atheism, there's really no place in atheism logically to be able to say what is right and what is wrong. That's a different discussion for a different time. But atheism cannot consistently define what is right and what is wrong. And so to a world which tries to dismiss God and then tries to say that this is right and this is wrong is just wholly out of league and inconsistent with itself. But you think about what the world tries to teach and the immorality, at least from, from a godly perspective, that the world tries to say is okay and is accepted. You think about lying, Right? No big deal. You want to keep your word. Drunkenness. Ah, you want to have a good time? Well, sure. I want to have, who doesn't want to have a good time? Oh, well, how do you have a good time? Go out and get hammered. Right? That's how you have a good time. You never see on those alcohol commercials the rehab centers, do you? You don't see the broken homes. You don't see the children whose lives are negatively impacted. No. We see volleyball on the beach. We see football tailgates. We see cornhole. Everybody loves cornhole. Revealing our bodies. Right? You, you look at, at how the world advertises. And it's usually not the girls in the t-shirts and the jeans, is it? It's all sorts of different portions of our bodies being revealed. Advertising realizes sex sells. And so advertising plays towards that. And the idea that sex sells leads just towards that, sexual sin. And we see this glorified in Hollywood all around us, right? Doesn't take too hard of a look. Do you remember when Pearl Harbor came out? And the uproar that came about when the, the, the case of immorality that happens in that movie and people were all abuzz with that? And now that happens all the time throughout movies and nobody bats an eye about it. The world's teaching us, isn't it? been around 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, 60, 70, 80, 90 years. Hey, the world's teaching us we get it. I'm pretty confident in being able to stand against the world. But, but then here comes the younger generation. Here come our children. Here come our grandchildren. How do we counteract these messages? How do we deal constructively with these messages? How can we counter the world's morality? I'd submit to you it starts where Peyton read for us this morning. Come back here to Deuteronomy chapter 6 with me. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Here's where it starts. We counter the world's morality, number one, by making conversation normal. By making conversation normal. Look, I like having my screen in my pocket, but sometimes that's exactly where my screen needs to stay, in my pocket. You've been to a restaurant, looked over and seen everybody in the family, including Grandma and Grandpa, staring at their screen? Right? Kids these days. And then here, here's Grandma playing Angry Birds. Okay? Look, I'm, I'm not saying it's wrong to, to get on your phone and check the news, check a, check a sports, store, good, uh, sports score. Goodness, I do that all the time. But when, when that's what dinner looks like all the time, when that's what the living room looks like all the time, when we can't sit and talk, when we can't ride in the car without something glaring in our faces, there's a problem. Because those are times that we can use to have these conversations, but instead the world is exerting its influence still. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 7. 
You have this introductory line in verse 4 that was so important to the Hebrews, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Come down to verse 7. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. The idea there is that at every station of the day, laying down, rising up, walking, standing, sitting, whatever it is, we find an opportunity to talk about these things. You shall bind them, verse 8, as a sign on your hand. They shall be uh, as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gate. Surrounding ourselves with opportunity for conversation and then capitalizing on that. Having the conversations. Because catch this, if we don't have the conversations, if we're not willing to even have some of these uncomfortable conversations, guess who will? The world. If we're not going to talk about our kids or talk to our kids and our grandkids about these things, rest assured the world will. And the world is going to share a message that none of us in this building this morning are comfortable with. Look at what this does when we share these messages, when we make time for conversation. You come over to chapter 6 and verse 20. And what are the children doing? What are the grandchildren doing? Asking questions. When your son asks you in time, saying, what do the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments mean? Then you shall say to your son, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and it goes on from there. But here's the point I'd have you take away. We do these little things so that we can have the bigger conversations. And sometimes we're doing the little things not so that we can have the conversation tomorrow or next week, but maybe next month or maybe next year or maybe a couple years down the line. But look, if we're waiting until our kids are 18 to have a talk about sexual immorality, folks, we miss the boat. And if we're waiting until our kids are 18 to talk to them about, well, you probably shouldn't wear this because it's too revealing and it sends out the wrong message, we've missed the boat. And if we're waiting until our kids are going off to college to warn them about the dangers of worldliness and alcoholism and things like that, we have missed the boat. We've missed the opportunity to influence. Now, I'm not saying that if we've missed it up to this point that we just throw our hands up and quit. But I am saying we need to redouble our efforts to make sure we have these conversations and have them early, even if these conversations are uncomfortable. And unpleasant because they need to be had. Well, where do I start? Just start with making conversation a normal part of your family. Set aside some time and just say, This is going to be the time that we're not going to have screens. And yeah, it's going to be awkward the first time you do it. What's, what's dad doing? No screens? But then you make that a part of who you are and who your family is. You make time for conversation. And look, when I say make time for conversation, I'm not saying, hey, let's all sit down and discuss Revelation chapter 14. Kids, bring the Bible. You're about to tell Daddy what this means. No. But can, can we sit down and, and just talk about life? Talk about things I experienced when I was their age? Listen and understand to what they're going through? We need to make conversation in our families normal, but that's not all. We need to set clear and godly expectations. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You ever been in an organization where the expectations were not clear? You ever been writing a paper in school and the expectations were not clear? I mean, I'm not speaking from personal experience or anything like that. Thinking back to eighth grade English class. I finally just gave up one time and we had a student teacher who gave us a sample paper. And all I did is I took her sample paper and I changed the themes. But I wrote the same amount of words she did. I structured it the same way she did. And I got a C on the paper somehow. I don't know. 
Expectations were not clear. It's frustrating when expectations are not clear. We don't know where we're going. We don't know what we're trying to do, who we're trying to please. But this is where we need to take a page out of God's book in our families. And as moms and dads, as grandparents, we need to be able to communicate clear and godly expectations to our kids. When we talk about understanding God's will for our lives, there's a whole lot in the religious world that seems very abstract about that. Well, who, who really knows what God's will is? I mean, sometimes God's will is for me to leave my wife and, and go with this person who I think I really love. No, it's not. But so often God's will just becomes a substitute for whatever I feel like doing that day. But of course, I think we recognize that's not the will of God. The will of God is so much deeper and more fulfilling than that. And while it's sometimes pictured to us that we can't really understand what the will of God is because there's just so many ins and outs to it, could I submit to you that there are times in Scripture where God's will is made abundantly clear to us? And one of them is here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting in verse 1, Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God just as you actually do walk, that you excel still more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the... Lord Jesus, verse 3, for this is the will of God. You want to find what the will of God is for your life, here's a place where we can take our fingers and set it down on the piece of paper and say, this is what God wants from me. This is the will of God, your sanctification, your holiness, your distinction from the world, that you abstain from what? Sexual immorality. You want to know what the answer to the question never is? Sexual immorality. Unless the question is, what is not a part of God's will for your life? And then the answer is sexual immorality. Sexual immorality is not to be a part of who we are. But what's the world going to teach? The world's going to say you got that FOMO, that fear of missing out. So YOLO, you only live once. Go be you. Go live your life. What would the Lord say? What do we as parents and grandparents need to say? God's will says no. Not because there's something wrong with sex, but because there's a special place where God has placed it in the confines of a marriage relationship. We need to be able to set godly and clear expectations. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. Sexual immorality has no place in the will of God. But look at 1 Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4. Look at verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has also ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of his time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. So we're supposed to live for the will of God. 1 Thessalonians 4, no sexual immorality. But keep a context here, 1 Peter 4. We're living for the will of God. What's the very next thing he talks about in verse 3? For the time already past is sufficient for you who have carried out the desires of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality and lust and drunkenness and carousals and drinking parties and abominable idolatries. And in all this they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excess of dissipation and they malign you. They speak evil of you. What is part of God's will for our lives? Not only that we would abstain from lust and sensuality and sexual immorality, verse 3, but that we would abstain from drunkenness and carousals. Those are your frat style um, drinking encounters. And drinking parties, which some scholars would note would reflect our modern notion of recreational drinking. Drinking, but not with the goal of excess in mind. Can we set godly and clear expectations? Are we communicating those to our children and our grandchildren? I mean, goodness, we get so upset about hair color and makeup choices and lipstick color in our children, 
And, and I'm not saying there might not be a place to have those discussions, but are we missing the forest for the trees? We need to set godly and clear expectations, clear expectations as to what God's will actually is. I have been thinking and thinking and trying and trying how to communicate this. And I guess this is where it's going to be. Come, come back to 1 Peter chapter 3 and look at verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 3. How can we counter the world's morality? We counter the world's morality by reinforcing what true beauty actually is. Some of you are going to have no clue what I'm talking about when I talk about Instagram. All right, so if, if that just flew over your head, just sit there and smile for a few minutes. All right. But those of you that do know what Instagram is, and Facetune, and all of that stuff, right? I am scared for the world that my daughter is about to enter. Because it's a world that's so fake, so fraudulent. I mean, you can't look at any picture on the internet without that picture, and especially, and I, this, isn't, this doesn't just apply to women, but it seems to apply to women in the majority of cases. And I'm not saying they're the ones that are doing it. This is just how they're being presented, either by themselves or others. Pictures of, that, that bear no resemblance to who that person is in real life. Right? Photoshopped and touched up. Face-tuned and all of that. But there's no, there's no warning sticker slapped on that saying, this is not reality, this is just, you know, the concoction of somebody's imagination. But then those very same pictures are set forward to our, our young ladies, especially saying, this is what true beauty actually is. You wonder why we have such a problem with body dysmorphia in our culture today? This is why. Because people just present themselves as something that they are not, reinforce that this is what is normal, and then when I don't fit what this normal is, I've got to change myself to make myself fit what normal actually is. Are we letting the world dictate to our children, to our families, what beauty actually is? And I promise you, I don't think we have anyone named Gertrude here. I'm not Sister Gertrude who's up here, you know, all the young people coloring their hair and stuff like that. And Sister Gertrude has been dyeing her hair for 20 years, right? Okay, I'm not talking about that. Okay? And I hope you get that. I'm talking about understanding and communicating to our children, to our grandchildren, to our daughters, what true beauty actually is. I'm not saying it's wrong to put on a dress and shoes and look nice. But I am saying we need to emphasize what true beauty actually is to our children. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 3. Let not your adornment be external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry and putting on dresses, but rather let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and a quiet spirit which is precious in the sight of God. Are we emphasizing to our young people that true beauty is inward? That you're beautiful when you're godly. Now that doesn't mean that you have to go out and marry the ugliest physically person out there. It doesn't set a priority on falling out of the ugly tree and hitting every branch on your way down. But it does mean that physical beauty is less important than true, lasting, imperishable beauty. We don't get that at 18. At least, if you like me, you don't. We appreciate that more and more as we get older, right? 
which makes our jobs as parents and grandparents all the more important that we communicate to our young people what beauty actually is. In a world that is full of Instagram and Facebook photos that are face-tuned and filtered beyond belief, good works from a good heart is what true beauty actually is. And let's just add this in before we go further. There's nothing wrong with appreciating physical beauty in ourselves and appreciating physical beauty in others. Go read the book of Song of Solomon sometime, right? There's nothing wrong with appreciating, not lusting, appreciating physical beauty in others or ourselves. But we've got to understand what true beauty actually is. And true beauty stems from a godly heart. And we need to be able to emphasize that and teach that and share that in our homes and in our families and in our churches. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. We need to limit the intake of the world's messages. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8, You were formerly darkness, but now you were light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And do not participate in the unfruitful works of darkness but rather expose them. We need to limit the intake of the world's messages. That may mean we take up cell phones at night. may mean we take up cell phones during the day. may mean that my 8-year-old doesn't get a cell phone, right? We need to limit the intake of the world's messages. And we need to expose the world's messages for what they are. Verse 13, all things become visible when they are exposed by light, for everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, awake sleeper and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be careful how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. The world is going to teach our children morality. We need to be willing to have these conversations with them before the world does. We need to be able to talk about these things and feel comfortable talking about them. How about this? The world is going to teach our children love. How, how is love pictured in our society today? How is love pictured in our society today? Listen here to what Vera Nazarian would say about love. Love is made up of three unconditional properties in equal measure. Acceptance and understanding and appreciation. Remove any one of the three and the triangle falls apart. Acceptance, understanding, appreciation. Unconditional acceptance, unconditional understanding, unconditional appreciation. That's what love is. Unconditional understanding. Unconditional appreciation. Unconditional acceptance. When my wife and I had um, some of, when we were hosting, some of you know what hosting is, along the lines of international adoption. We had one little girl who stayed with us during the summer. Sweet little girl. Struggled with fetal alcohol syndrome going back to what we talked about earlier. One of the things we did was we found some old MP3 players that we had. And we loaded it up with just some good kid-style music, and we gave them little headphones that they could listen. Sophia had hers. Walked into her room one day to go and check on her. She's got that headphone on, Got that 3.5 millimeter jack at the end of it, trying to plug it into the electrical outlet. I love Sophia. And that's what Sophia thought she needed to do. She thought that's what was right. Now, if I unconditionally accept her, and that's what it means to love her, do I just let her do what she wants to do? I mean, by this definition, if, if this is the definition of love, unconditional acceptance, unconditional understanding, under, 
unconditional appreciation. If that's what love is, whatever decision my child wants to make, I just embrace them and go along with it because that's what love is. But the moment your child starts to run out here onto 1604, what are you going to do? You're going to run out there and stop them, aren't you? Or if your kid tries to put the headphone jack into the electrical outlet, you're going to stop them, aren't you? And it's not because I unconditionally accept them, unconditionally understand them, or unconditionally appreciate them. It's because I love them, and I'm going to make sure that they don't harm themselves. We'll talk about that more in just a moment. L listen to this. This was an unnamed post on the Love Means Acceptance web, uh, Love Means Acceptance publication uh, in Awaken Inside in March, uh, May 4, 2017. When someone feels accepted as they are, they don't feel any pressure to be anything other than who they are. They can be truly authentic. They can express themselves naturally and freely, and they begin to open up to the most authentic expression of who they are. And when they're able to be totally and completely authentic, honest, and transparent, there's a radiance about them. They can be truly happy. Problem with that? True authenticity in all of this would assume that, that we've got the right answers to begin with. And it doesn't allow for scenarios like we just described where you've got a kid about to run onto the highway or put their headphones into the electrical outlet. When someone feels accepted as they are, they don't feel any pressure to be anything other than who they are. They can be truly authentic. But that's not what God calls us to be. He doesn't call us to be ourselves, does he? calls us to be conformed to the image of his son. How does the, how does the world picture love? It's full and uncompromising acceptance of anything. And the only way that you're unloving is if you what? Is if you refuse to accept somebody for what they say they are or what they say they want to do then you're unloving. But let me submit to you that the world is wrong about love. In the first place, love recognizes the value of all. Here's another thing where the world that tries to rid itself of God finds itself up a creek without a paddle. Where in an atheistic worldview is there room for love? Darwin certainly didn't have it. Darwin had survival of the fittest, right? You don't allow your worst animals to breed, and that, by the way, is a direct quotation from Darwin. You don't allow your worst animals to breed. So our little girl who's with, stricken with fetal alcohol syndrome trying to plug her electrical, or trying to plug her headphones into the electrical outlet, atheistic worldview taken logically and consistently would say what? That's how life goes. Don't allow your worst animals to breed. Call the herd. That's, a, that's an empty worldview, isn't it? But love, in a biblical worldview, recognizes the value of all because all are made, Genesis 1, in the image of God, right? Right? Love reaches out for others. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, what is God doing here? He's not simply talking about love, but he demonstrates love. God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, what happened? Christ died for us. Love reaches out for others. That's what it does. It's not about full-throated acceptance of whoever and whatever. But love recognizes that sometimes people can make a wrong decision, and if they're making a wrong decision or heading that way, I'm reaching out for them, trying to get them to stop. In Mark chapter 10 and verse 21, love challenges us to do what is necessary. In Mark chapter 10 and verse 21, 
After counseling the, the, the rich young ruler, Jesus looked at him and felt a love for him and said to him, There is one thing that you lack. Go and sell all that you possess. Give it to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Here's what love does is it challenges us to do what is necessary. Love recognizes a standard, an absolute standard of right and wrong and acts in accord with that standard. And then finally, the world is going to teach priorities. And you think just very briefly about what is not competing for our time. Come over here to Mark chapter 12. This is where we're wrapping up, Mark chapter 12. You think about what is not competing for our time today. But the reality is our priorities are seen in the time and the energy that we dedicate to tasks and things and people. You want to talk about church attendance without ever mentioning church attendance? This is it. What we give our energy and time to are the things that we view as being important. If I view the worship of God and His people as important, I'm there with them. And if I don't, then I won't be. It's as simple as that. But the world is going to teach our children priorities. You don't need to go to church. You really don't even need to serve God. Who's God? There is no God. Just do whatever you want to do. Live for yourself. Which is just the complete opposite of everything that is presented to us in Scripture. So are we teaching our children the proper priorities? Look at Mark chapter 12. In verse 30, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the foremost commandment in verse 29. And in verse 31, the second is like to it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Three people here. Number one, we've got to care for ourselves. Have you ever seen this person before that is so dedicated to serving others that it actually takes a toll on them and they're unable to do anything further because they haven't taken care of themselves? Uh, th there is a baseline here in this passage that would talk to us about the need to take care of ourselves. That we can't really be of service to others and service to God if we're not first taking care of ourselves. But making sure that we care for ourselves then enables us to make others a priority. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. While making sure that we hold up God as the priority. Loving God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength world's going to try to teach our kids what's important. And I would hasten to think that what the world views as important is not what most of us in this auditorium this morning think is important. But our kids aren't going to know that unless we talk with them about it, unless we have these conversations, and unless we model this kind of behavior. So the world is teaching, and I need to make sure I am too. I need to make sure I demonstrate God as a priority in my life. I need to make sure that I'm talking about what love actually is to my children. I need to emphasize morality in my family, and, and perhaps more than that, I need to model that same morality in my family. It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to say it and actually do it. Which means maybe some of the entertainment choices I made without kids changes when kids come into the picture. But man, the most important thing here is pointing my home towards heaven. This is what it's about. You have been very gracious this morning and I appreciate it. This is what it's about. 
It's about showing our kids, our grandkids. It's about piloting our families towards heaven. Showing that God and heavenly things are most important. Colossians chapter 3, if you have been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things which are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on things of the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. You want to go to heaven? You want to please God? We've got to make Christ our life. Christ my life and if Christ is not your life this morning we want to help you make that change we want you to come to him we want you to have that hope of heaven the hope of glory that he provides we want you to be able to defeat the world to overcome the world's messages and in the end please our heavenly father If you've never come to Jesus Christ, you have that opportunity this morning to come to Him, confess Him as your Savior, repent of sins, die with Him, and raise to walk in newness of life in the waters of baptism. But maybe as a Christian, Christ hadn't been your life like He ought to be. And maybe you're ready to make a change this morning. We're ready to pray with you and to pray for you and to help you in whatever way we can. If you'd simply know by letting us, or simply if you would let us know by coming while we stand and while we sing. My stuff.